Hey, welcome back to the podcast. Daniel here. We've got another special episode for you today. You might remember that a couple weeks back, we did a special episode that was filmed in the lobby of Brooklyn Music Factory. We invited a bunch of school owners to come and meet up with us in December of 23, and we spent the day just socializing, giving a tour of Brooklyn Music Factory, talking about Nate's 10-year strategy and vision. We did a live Q&A and coaching session with them, and we went out for dinner and drinks afterwards. It was an awesome time, and honestly, we plan on doing that at least once here this year, so be on the lookout for that. We are going to give more advanced notice, I'll, I'll, I'll add. Uh, we didn't give much notice, and we still had pretty good turnout for that uh, event in December. We were we recorded, we filmed part of that day. Um, obviously, we didn't film everything, but we didn't film part of that day. And the episode that we'd released two weeks ago, episode 104, was one portion of the Q&A. It was a, a question that Nate answered at length. Today's episode is the rest of that Q&A slash coaching session. And we took a number of questions from the owners who showed up there that day. And that's what this episode is. So hope you enjoy. And we're going to jump right into the episode. Okay, uh, we have the next question was branding of company how did we decide values and how are we living the values does that feel like a good next topic this is a great question the founders decide the values and by deciding the values what you're really doing is clarifying what you're already living right so it's not you're not making something up you're just trying to simmer down all of these personal values that you already wake up in a approach the day with and try to get a little bit more succinct. And in the case of partnerships, you try to align on the ones that you want to include that you can both get behind. A good example of one that came from my partner was, was discover everyone's story. So she was very much like, like this inclusivity piece and the willingness to make sure that everybody is welcome was super important to her. And, um, it was important to me, but I didn't think about it in the same, in that way exactly. You know, one that was super important to me is 100% engaged emotionally and intellectually. So I spent a lot of my life like this working on presence. And most of it comes from a life as a performer, you know, as a musician. We're constantly challenging ourselves to be wholly present for the full gig, you know, or the full rehearsal or... You know, as you evolve as an artist, you always hear people talking about, like, leave it at the door. Don't bring anything in here. That was important to me. And she's, she's like, okay. So finding your values is less, we created a list, probably had like 30 of them. And then we whittled it down to like 20. And then we brought it, and then we went back and forth. It took us maybe a month. And then we brought it to... The rest of the team and we're like here's we've got it down to these 10 what do you think so we were starting sharing it right now um core values is that it's very much like a corporate term that you see you know you walk into uh you know whatever you walk into the shopify headquarters and they're gonna have their core values painted on the wall and for us at the time that's who introduced it to us. We were getting leadership training. We were going and we were getting business training at this point. And they were like, you really need to get this together because otherwise you're always going to have culture issues. For us, it was a mega turnoff because we were like, this just, we're not a corporate endeavor. Um, and so the, the, the shift for me and her was like, oh, no, no, no. Actually, we're already doing this. We're just not saying it out loud. And we're not yet, we're not yet confident enough in these values to put them on a wall, right? And so, um, the last piece of that is when you write, we have seven core values and when we put them up there, it's not as if you're crushing them every day, you know, it's just that you have these core values that you're aspiring to showing up and to live and teach by when you're on the job site. Right. And, um, so that's how we came up with it, and it's messy, and eventually you just say we're done, and you 
you put them in ink, right? Now, that's actually the easy part. Um, to your second half of the question, well, has anybody actually worked on core values like in their business? Melanie, you have. Yeah. Yeah, when I had a bigger program, they did. And... Cool. Okay, good. So we all have a little bit of experience around it, or some of us do. Um, <clears throat> the the um, second part of your question is a great one, which is like, well, how do you actually then implement it? I'm curious in yours, did you, what were examples of how you had the values start to pervade? Yeah, um, I think that like collaboration was um, a really big value. Um, and the program that I ran, uh, there were three of us teaching. Um, it was sort of a combination of group classes and private lessons. And students took uh, lessons with different teachers. Also like listening was another value um, and that obviously like came into play with like teaching music, um, incorporating like, uh, you know, the work of like Pauline Oliveros with like, um, our beginning students even. Um, but it also had to do with, you know, we had people who were coming from very disparate backgrounds, very dif disparate socioeconomic levels. Um, and you know, just sort of like sometimes in spaces like tension can arise from that and sort of having a commitment to having you know if if conflict arose um to not trying to just sort of like say oh this isn't like the space for that to happen but um you know being willing to engage in conversations with each other um i think uh you know and then just kind of like uh in terms of like the repertoire that we taught and um i'm like not really into Suzuki. Um, I, I, I very much have a lot of respect for Suzuki uh, philosophy, um, but like the rep, I'm just kind of like, I don't want to teach that. Like, and, and sorry, like, no, no offense to anyone who teaches Suzuki and, and loves it. I'm not trying to hate on it, but um, just really like did not feel aligned with like who I was and what my interests are um, as a musician and um, also what I perceived the interests of like the students coming to us were. Um, so yeah, so sort of like the kinds of repertoire that we're incorporating to like right canon. So it's interesting to, so if I were to recap, I, I didn't quite connect the value to the rep, but first it's methodology, right? It's saying like, Hey, here's the system of how we actually, um, teach, which is that I love the no silos approach. That's, that's awesome. In other words, this, this student is going to touch multiple members of the mm -hmm. community. Right. Um, and then the second one is, you know, we have a core value that's listening. Here's an example of how we're going to apply it. When two students or two teachers are at in conflict over something, whatever mm -hmm. it is, we're actually not going to choose option a, which would be I like what you said, like, this is not a space for that. We're going to, we're going to purposefully choose option B, which is frankly a harder route, right? Which is like, we're going to listen and work through it. Um, those are great examples. The, at the factory, some really just like simple, practical ways that we do it. Um, our all staff meeting, which is every month is always themed with a core value. Right. So we might do a core value of check your ego at the door. And then that three hour meeting, somehow we're referencing that with every segment of the meeting. Like, let's talk about a time when you are really like, how are you struggling right now as a teacher? And we'll do like a 30 minute round on so that we're trying to just like develop that um, value. Um, other really simple ways are that when we not simple to apply, but simple in concept, which is that our hiring funnel is all value. We literally have them mm. reference value. We ask them, what are your core values in hiring in the initial interview? And we even show them our core values and we say, which one are you going to thrive with right out of the gate if you were working here and which value are you going to really struggle with and tell us why. 
you know, so the, the right, right away you're checking your ego at the door if you'll even answer that question, right? Um, so that's how we do it. And then, of course, you have the things like put it in print, share it often. Um, the way it was taught to me was basically just say it over and over and over and over. And when people start rolling their eyes, you're like, now you know you're doing your job. That's how it was taught to me. Um, and it can feel like weird, but doesn't feel weird when I hear you describing it. You're like, hey, we're having a tricky conversation. Let's practice listening. Mm. I'm like, okay, good. I'm working on listening anyways. <laughs> you know, like then it's like it feels very natural when you apply it there. I mean, I do things like all the time where I'm like, okay, you want to be 100% engaged? It's very easy. Turn your phone off and put it in your bag for the five hours you're teaching. Here's a simple choice. Just remove the phone and you will be already more engaged. You know, um, then I'll say that often, you know, um, so you can provide opportunity, you can provide training around it. Um, is that mostly any follow-up questions, comments, concerns, or jokes? Kind of follow-up questions? Yeah, I love it. It's like, yeah. how do you know how effective your values are at reaching like families you serve? Like, did the families ever say or pair back any of those values? Like, so, oh, we love coming to be, uh, brought the music factory because of the creativity. They love coming here because of the, I'm shaping for the band, the community. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Jessica just said the other day in, um, so we have the, one of our core values is find joy in every day and every way. And we start our meetings at Melanie's and subject to this numerous time, the positive focus to start our meetings. And that's one of the ways we practice her. You know, it's like, stay, can we stay optimistic in this moment, even if everything else is going wrong around us? Um, Jessica just said to me, she said in her positive focus, she said in our group and our leadership meeting, she's like, I'm getting eat more and more emails from parents that are saying they're grateful for the lessons and they're using language that we use. And they're like, we love the game-based approach. Or really appreciate how you build community. Um, you validate my child. Um, she is, she'll be a songwriter for life. You know, and that language is coming out in just little notes. And that's super moving to us. And that I would say is absolutely an evidence of success. Like, you know, for you, David, I would say, you're, 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 you're crafting this purpose statement. You're in the middle of it. Like by the end of 2024, dude, you'll definitely have your elevator pitched down. <laughs> but like, I want to bump in, like I want one of my friends who's studying with you to be like, I just like, I'm serious about this. I want to be serious about this. And like working with David makes me feel serious about it. Mm. Like that's what I want to hear him say when I'm having a drink with him. And then I'm like, dig it. That's what David's, that's really what David's purpose is, is empowering people to, they're allowed to be serious about something that might be a hobby or whatever. I mean, I don't know if that's accurate, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think one of the challenges that people have is that they, I think they work the wrong way. They, they start with a, they, well, what you were saying, they invent a value and I think what's more helpful for people is to actually uh, get that clarity. And then it isn't just about putting on the piece of paper, but it's about operating from that value and, and kind of, in, and this is really what I want to get to, that trust in the, in, in the inherent direction of your in, intuition, where you shouldn't just be making decisions from that intuition but oftentimes either fear or an idea of what's the tactic? What's the tactic to get more students? What's the tactic to keep them? What's the tactic to keep the teachers? What's the tactic for this and that? And, you know, there's nothing wrong with being wise and seeing, oh, this tends to work. This is a smart idea. But when you're operating from that values piece, a lot of times you end up coming up with things that are unique to you that 
that solve those problems naturally. But most of the time people are too fearful to trust that intuition or they're so beset by anxiety that they don't, that they actually, it can't even come through. Mm-hmm. It's like trying to hear someone speaking if you've got like a white noise speaker right next to you. Like it's just going to be impossible. You won't hear someone speaking. You're, you're actually drowning out your own, your, your own intuition and wisdom apparatus. That's that initial piece took around like the taking the time to really work through that list and be like, hmm, severing those values down with your partner or on your own um, and being patient so that you're, yeah, like Daniel put was just right on the money. Um, we're not making anything up. Yeah. You know? Um, and to your comment, when we were filling our tea, you were like, Daniel is amazing. He's helped me with my website. It's just totally changed lead gen for you. Like, you can absolutely use tactics like Daniel's just mentioned. We would be fools not to use yeah. the wisdom of Daniel and his sharing us. You know, it's not either or, you know. Um, so hmm. that's, you know, and that's really important because that actually was one of my resistance points was to be like, I'd feel very clear on purpose and values and then I would sort of resist taking um, certain advice that felt to me like uh, almost like hacks or something. And I would be like, I remember when we first, when we hired you in 2019, it was, we had, had gone through an annual planning where we were just like, we finally realized like when we bring on an expert, we grow. Hmm. And it's like, it's just like, we were like, it seems obvious. Like, you know what I mean? Like we studied with experts on our instruments, you know, like I was like, I don't know how I missed it in this context, but, Hmm. um, so just Hmm. accepting the wisdom from the experts and implementing that while still owning, you know, your values. Like I just, that's great, which is a great segue actually the date night question you had events the, let me read the because this is very much in that intuitive um comment piece let me just read actually what you wrote hey don't want a minute you're new there you go. all the extras that were doing date nights concerts and then you were like how do you you know it's not you basically were i'm paraphrasing but you were like it's not you doing it so how do you work out the staffing when did you know that you had the bandwidth to take that on? Um, so all the extra projects you're doing. Yeah. What's the motivation for running the program? So we'll start there. Um, let's take something super easy that's just prevalent, like birthday parties. Like all I have to do is walk the Gowanus. I'm sure it's the exact same in Williamsburg. Every after school program is offering birthday parties, right? So. Why do birthday parties matter? Are birthday parties, first of all, um, what are you offering matters? We're offering a songwriting party. Kids come in, they write a speed song, they perform the speed song. It's very on brand for what we do, right? It's in this space, da, 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 da. So we know what we've developed. We've developed a product that is reflective of us. It reflects who we are and what we do. Right. Okay. So why does it matter? When is it time to develop that? Well, in our experience, um, we developed it for a couple few reasons. One, we had vacant space that we were paying rent on, right? We weren't going to become an event every weekend venue, right? We just, we, we, that's not who we were at the time. And so we, we had all of these spots, all of these two hour, three hour slots where nobody was in the space. And we're like, how are we going to maximize that? It was very important to us that we weren't teaching seven days a week because we leave Sundays open for our events and our songwriting parties. And we really, really wanted to be able to honor that. We'll look ahead to that Sunday and be like, it's January. You got a bunch of gigs here. We're psyched. We also didn't want to have to administer seven days a week. Like a day of rest was important. 
okay, for us. And it was for what we were doing. Um, so that was one thing. Number two, we wanted to generate revenue uh, because we wanted to invest in things. And we need that. We, we were like, okay, here's a way. The most we've ever made on birthday parties is 24000 in a year. In 2023, we'll, we will have made like eight or 9000 and we're just rebuilding it. And we're just now deciding, literally, are we going to push this as a revenue generator, right? And when you're generating revenue, when you need to know why you need to generate that revenue, right? It's... Um, Anyways, that's a totally different conversation. But why? Well, why do you need to know? Why do you need to know? Because um, uh, so I've said this some on the podcast, but we've never really done a deep dive into it. But ideally, when you're running your business at any scale, you'll have some very clear budget where you can look at. Like Melanie and I, we're, we're working on that. You know. We'll have a very clear budget and we'll look at each line and we'll say, we're going to allocate this percentage of, of every dollar we make, we're going to allocate this percentage to these different lines. And lines can be people, they can be rent, they can be curriculum development, they can be a whole host of things, right? Um, and so if, you, um, if you've sorted out your percentage that you want to allocate, then, as you then now you can um, rationally grow, because as you grow, as you bring in more dollars, you're saying, "Great, I got another dollar, which means I get another one percent that I can spend on curriculum development." Right? I've got another, or maybe you need to increase your income yourself. Okay, I've got another dollar, and and that means I'm getting. I'm only making 15% net, but at least there's a little bit more coming to me now, you know? Um, so with birthday parties um, is an example of where if you have clarity on your budget and what you need the cash for, then you can try to generate more revenue and send it there. If you don't have clarity, then you're giving up your most valuable resource, which is time, which gets back to the initial question which is when do you know if you have bandwidth, i.e. swap that out for time to do this, right? If you were reactive to it, if all of a sudden we're doing like cello birthday parties because our friend told us to, then it's just like you're, you're, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really, I love the look in your face. <laughs> you know, it's like how many opportunities come across your radar every single week Yeah, because you've heard about someone doing it and like, quote, killing it. They're like, they're doing amazing with these things. That, what you just said there, right there is probably one of the things I hear the most from folks. And it's just a question. Hey, we're doing piano guitar now. Should we add drums? Yeah. And I mean, I hate to be simplistic, but if you're asking that question, you probably shouldn't. You probably shouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. Let's take the factory for a second. So we have these songwriting parties. You already probably can clearly see what's going to happen on the stage, January, whatever, 27th. There's going to be a drummer there, two pianists, a guitar player, a bass player, and a vocalist, right? If you start adding 100 drummers, what you've done is actually added 100 more, like 100 more original songs because they all have to collaborate. Otherwise, what do you, you know? Otherwise, you'd be a drum recital. Yeah, it could be yeah. just a drum recital. There's, so there's a possibility of offering a new version of a curriculum to go with it. But, the, but back to this initial example, is like we know how many pianists, guitarists, bass players, drummers, vocalists we have in the school right now. And we know what the band stand, we know how many bands we can build three months from now, right? And so we already know the pressure points as when we were like, do we have too many pianists? Obviously, we have too many pianists because that's just the nature <laughs> of, of our world is that for some reason, piano is always the top choice. Like, I don't know what's going on, but it is. And if you that's know, the case, grouplessons.com. Yeah, exactly. Go. exactly. <laughs> there you go. And so <laughs> with, I'd say the there's the plot. There's the plot. <laughs> totally. With, I'm saying within what we offer, our curriculum and methodology, 
you know, we can handle act, so many of X, Y, and Z. So, yeah, do we should we start adding drums because three people called this week asking for drum lessons? Sure, maybe. But do you have a very clear path for that drummer? Yeah. You know, if not, then maybe instead of saying yes to them and scrambling to find a teacher, you should invest that 10 hours into designing a clear path. So that next season you can set, you can hire a drum teacher and then be prepared for next season. Um, so birthday parties, that's sort of an easy example. You're on point with brand. You know what you're going to do with the money when you get it. You know how much money you need or how much money you want. Um, you can easily price those because doing market research on that stuff is easier than falling off a log. You can just search the web for 10 minutes and you'll know your price point. You know, you know um, what spaces are like because everybody's posting photos of their fancy birthday party on their websites. So it's very easy to do the market research, very easy. To, um, so then you have to ask yourself, if you have all those things in place, then it actually doesn't take a lot of humans to pull off. Um, and you need to know that your initial six months to 12 months is around designing product hiring and training to this person who's going to be that birthday party like basically be ready and willing to work you know 10 hours a weekend as you start booking more of them um, and you need a sales you probably i mean you'll be great at selling that so you'd probably be the salesperson for a while but we eventually offboarded that to hillary who did camp and she sold all the birthdays in addition to camp um but at any rate it's there's a, we have a one sheet here's exactly what happens Here's pictures of how you set up for it. You know, it's all it's all systemized. And then we have maybe three people that can lead birthdays, and then we have a whole pile of teenagers that assist them. You know, that we hire, and that's the model. Yeah, there's one thought I, I wanted to interject here, and that is uh, another plug, but for something else. And uh, a lot of you have been reading the book by Alex Hormozzi, Hundred Million Dollar Leads. Yeah. Okay. He has a concept in there, um, round page 160, I think, called More Better New. Hmm. And one of the things he says is that as, as business owners, we actually learn the wrong lesson. We try to increase revenue or we try to improve the business in a certain way. And the way that we do it, we get rewarded over time by adding something new because there's always a pop. You, there's activity. You see something. It's hmm. much harder to dig deeper and optimize something that already exists it's much easier to start something new and see some activity from it yes but never op you but then you so you have this series of projects that you start and yes. and you and what he says is you learn the wrong lesson because oh yeah that did increase revenue when in reality he says you should just dig deep very deep and do more of what's working then after you do that you do it better Mm -hmm. And then only then do you think about adding something new. And so there's a lot of, and you aren't one of them, but there's a lot of school owners that I've worked with where uh, they, you know, I'm dealing with the fact that, oh, this teacher, I'm having all this trouble. And it's like, well, why are you having trouble with this teacher? Well, they're really upset for this. And then, you know, they've been spreading kind of some negativity around the school because we can't get them enough students. Well, why did you, why did you start? Why can't you give enough students? And it just, this cascading chain of issues that happened because they made a decision out of a felt need of necessity of like, oh, we can't make, we can't make a good profit margin. So we needed to add this clarinet program, you know, because we got three clarinet requests last year and we, and we thought, oh, great, we'll make some money. And it's just hot. And then I go in and I look at what they're doing in, you know, one of the big three, voice, piano, guitar, and they're not even fully... Yeah, yeah. They're not fully optimized there in terms of their marketing or, or that sort of thing. So, and I'm as guilt, I'm super guilty of this because I'm an ideas person. So I love the, I like, like, I listen to your story, David. I'm just like, man, that, I love what you're designing here. And it just gets the, it gets the, like, my Evernote wheels turning. And I'm just like writing notes of like amazing things you're doing. And so I have to be really check this. I have to really check this, and I'm going to share a date night example. I want to pivot away from birthdays, if that's cool. Yeah, go yeah. there. I'll just say one. You know, yeah, a good my, quote. Yeah, what do you got? You could have whatever you want in life, as long as you wait. Wait, hold on. You could have whatever you want in life, as long as you uh, want it far more than anything else. 
And there's just this idea of you yeah. just got to focus in on something. And I know that's kind of cliche. It looks it look nice and like a little motivational poster on the wall, but it really is true because I'm guilty of the same. I'm, I'm guilty of the same thing. Yeah. Well, we. Yeah. I wanted. I did some research getting my. This is our annual planning book, and I did some research and and I did something different this time with the numbers, where I looked at each product, and I said, how much revenue does this generate per hour. So teacher hour, but I mean, we'll say teacher hour, but it could be any number of things. You can do a date night hour. You, you can just say you have a human. So it's from the perspective of HR. It's from the perspective of you have people, we call it people power. You put people in there and how many, how many dollars does it generate per hour? So it, it was, the discovery was fascinating to me. And the thing that was most interesting to me was date nights. Because date nights did not hit for us when we fired them back up in September. Like, I'm currently the marketing director here at the factory, so I'm the one, like, you know, setting up the campaigns and trying to get people to show up. Um, and, and I was like, really? We only sold, like, you know, four. I remember the first night. Like, four of these $45 tickets to drop your kid off. And I was just like, it's not worth it. We should cancel. And it's a classic what Daniel was just saying. I was like, cancel. So, but um, we didn't. And I think mostly it was from pushback from both Pira, my partner, and Jessica, who were like, we should, well, let's run them because we put them on the books through the whole fall. We put them in the calendar already and we made our like cards, printed cards, and blah, blah, blah. So I was like, okay, dude, just don't panic, just stick with it. And so what's interesting, it takes, Will, who's our community manager, does it, plus a team. So that's two humans now that you have to pay that it is per hour. So it's two human hours. The thing lasts, I think it's three hours. So that's six hours, right? We got to the end of the year, and I pulled up a product report to see how many of these date nights we'd actually sold. And it ended up being that we'd sold something like 30 of these tickets over the like three date nights. So on the average, it ended up being closer to 10 per night. And... And it was $78 per hour was generated per, per human hour that we hit, had from date nights. And I was like, $78, that's, that's way more than I thought, actually. Mm -hmm. And then, so what do you think the highest per hour revenue generator is at the factory? It's actually pretty obvious. It's, I'll just tell you, it's private lessons, right? Which is the most expensive product. You have one person in there for an hour. It generates... $203 an hour. No, sorry. Um, I take that back. I'm, I'm, I'm wrong. I'm saying this all over again. It's more of, it's the band, the group class program mm -hmm. getting back, right? That's the answer, right? So that generates $203 per hour that we put a teacher in. This is September one through year to through year to date, right? Private lessons generates 125 per hour right? Camp, this is what was really fascinating to me, generates, it takes, you know, you have humans here from 8.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. So it doesn't matter that they're teaching a class in there or they're sitting out here doing craft, you're still paying uh, a person, right? Because this is only, gen this is only people hours. That generates $104 an hour. So there you have date night generating $78 an hour. Now, obviously, there are fewer hours of people there than there are at camp, right? But still, it became fascinating to me to realize, like, stick with it, and maybe date night will turn into, like, $180 per hour a year from now. And now, all of a sudden, it's a pretty viable addition to what we offer, you know? Um, and, again, date night, like birthdays, is on brand. It's... It's a, a face that everybody recognizes, the desk person, right, Will, and writing speed songs, playing big music games, eating pizza, that's the two hours, right? Um, so anyways, in terms of special events, obviously there's an, a, an analysis there, but I would say the main takeaway is, is it uh, on brand for you? Is it very clearly what you're doing already but just packaged into something else. And is it purpose driven? So when we do these 
like the Charlie Brown, it's broadcast as an opportunity to offer scholarships. It is a communal event. Uh, we wrote a speed song mid-set, like we always do in the magic hour, so everybody's writing lyrics and everybody's singing an original composition in the set. So it's all sort of there, you know. And you guys will notice already, we're like two and a half hours into the hang and you hear me saying this stuff over and over, you're like, Nate's gonna say they wrote a song again. <laughs> but that's what we're talking about, right? That's your purpose. I just know exactly why I walk into this building, you know? And I, then I try to do it. And sometimes I'm grumpy and I hide in the studio and I don't do anything except for teach some lessons. But usually I don't, you know, hopefully I don't, right? That's sort of, that's a pretty good answer to your question. Um, any follow-up questions, comments, concerns about events? Well, yeah, what do you got? I'd be really curious to hear about your summer camps. Mm, which aspect of them? I am like a single teacher studio, a small studio, um, and I'm thinking about adding a program like a music and art camp to song. And I know I'm like nothing. Mm. <laughs> so maybe like what I okay. recommend. <laughs> well, let me say two things. Number one, you absolutely should pursue this in terms of just at least exploration of how are other people doing it. That's step one is to start researching. Um, but number two, um, to encourage you, in 2019, our summer camp was 30% of our revenue and was $500,000. Okay? So that's, that's our camp. <laughs> Not our summer camp, our camp. We do holiday camps, day camps too. So that included all the winter and spring and holiday. Secondly is that... Um, our camp literally mirrors, it takes a 15 week mini keys jam man 101 curriculum and stuffs it into five days. There's no, and we, with the addition of all those inner, the hours in between their songwriting rehearsals and mini keys and jam man 101. But if you open up the lesson plans and the templates and the reports, they look and feel exactly like a Tuesday afternoon in September, you know? Um, so. It's like totes, like a crash course. Piano Express does the same thing. You guys do the, the same thing. The, yeah. the summer camp is literally just the first book, and we, yeah. instead of doing it over a 12-week period, it's, you know, the session spread out over five days. Yeah, and then I want to hear Melanie, because Melanie started dabbling in camps, and so it be, might be interesting to get your perspective. One thing I'll say personally is that we did three episodes on camp in February of this past year. Yeah. That's going to be way deeper than anything we can do in the next 10 minutes. So I'll send those three episodes to you. Yeah. Well, I think there's still some high level stuff we can talk about, but yeah, absolutely. Especially since Melanie didn't talk about Well, Melanie, you, 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 um, yeah. Tell us your experience just so far and where you intend to go. Yeah. I mean, so uh, my previous experience had been running music theater camps and because that was my performing mm. experience. And I am so glad that we've shifted to um, the jam band, which is the songwriting for six to nine year olds is what we enroll. Although we did do a camp that had 10 year olds in it and it, it, it did agree. It did. Yeah, yeah. So I am selling them so much easier. It's Hopeful low maintenance compared to Hulu. painting sets and getting props <laughs> and, and making sure kids have their costumes and they have a 15 minute show memorized instead. It's like, oh, you created the song yourself and it's so organic because they made it and it's special to them. It's not me asking them yes. to be a parrot and repeat things in a very short period of time. And yes. so they're so ready and feeling so good at that Friday performance for the parents. Um, it was a big hit. Um, Nate told me once, don't expect your summer campers to enroll in their school year. Um, there are going to be people who just do your summer camps, and that is true. Um, and we did have some year-round people come in, but I'm not great at selling at our current students on our camps. They're just like, no, we've had a great 10 months with you. We'll see you in September. 
And uh, so, and Daniel has all these strategies for selling uh, Piano Express over the summer. I have not been successful with that. So I, I can be your person that does, can tell you what doesn't work. Um. <laughs> can I add something on leads for camp? Yeah. Because this is one more like, yeah. oh, hell yeah, you should at least explore it. This is our lead report from 2023. Um, dig this. Okay, so last year we had um this is just landing pages but we had 1594 new leads okay last year dig this 1037 of them were camp leads hmm. oh interesting yeah yeah wow. Wow. our growth rate check this out just day camps alone that's holiday day camps that's not summer it's not spring break 742 leads yeah, really. it's mind-bending this is like this and this isn't nate being like and here's why this is me being like what's going on because <laughs> we're we have a, our waiting list for camp is just it's at least 100 families long wow. you know and we are now we think that one of our annual priorities in 2024 is going to be to expand to like to multi-location multiple locations but we're not sure yet which we haven't decided on what the projects are going to be yet, but we think that that's going to be one of them because clearly we're getting way too many leads. It's actually, it's a, it's not good to get that many leads and be like, wait, what? You can't serve these people. And yet you're having them all. How many, sorry, how many leads could you get total for the year? And then how many for, yeah, 1,000. This is, this is on landing. This is purely landing page leads. 1,594 okay. total. And a thousand of them are camp. That's like. And so interesting. So your private, like your, your annual um, leads are around 60. 500. Our annual leads are 500. That's from the landing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah from yeah. the landing page. Oh, okay. So that's just one place. And we have tight, we have some other, a couple of others, but in truth, it's that's like, expensive. it's probably like a thousand leads for after school and a thousand for camp, probably 50, 50. Yeah. But here's the deal. Is we made when we opened this space, we are our, our um, one of our three annual objectives last year was to rebuild our reputation okay. because we had spent two plus years in borrowed space and basements at Battalion Studio. We've been all over the joint, so we made this like things like we pushed Google reviews super hard. We mm. camp was a really important um, part of our program. So we invested, um, we invested a lot of time, effort, and resources into ensuring that the camp was totally sold out for this new space. And, and so we did sell it out and we had a great uh, summer camp in here. And so I think that's partly why we got so many leads. I'm definitely not gonna spend $8,000 on, uh, or we spent like 6,000 on camp lead. We're not even gonna turn on our Google ads. Yeah, you, you know, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, we're gonna. Do, you don't have to do. I don't. Yeah, I mean, I obviously overshot. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that was, but but that's that was, because we were just really wanted to get people in here to experience the space, you know, and make sure that it was sold out. So, anyways, that's a, that's an interesting statistic and, a prob probably a strategic misfire in a way. Look at what my camp inquiry is. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not that yet, no, no. but it may, it may get there eventually. I hope so. It is important to me. And we did do day camps, um, in the fall and two out of our three days that we were offering camps ran. And I, you know, um, I, I just love giving my teachers the work when they mm. want it on days where they wouldn't have it and they wouldn't have an income. And so when you look at it that way, you're like, it's totally worth it. Yeah. The kids in and aunt plus the teacher is making that money. And for the scale, for example, of the camp that we run, we will, we survey the teachers. It's like, like January 6th at our all staff. They, we survey them then to commit to summer. So they, they say like, yes, I'll, I can sign up for all of these weeks. And then I have to get back to you about these two, you know, like they're taking holiday or whatever. But we, we now do, you know, we're six months out to, to make sure that we're staffed 
Um, okay, that's that on the camp, but I agree with Daniel. Those apps that, and we, and Pira, who's my partner, who's the director of camp, is a guest on two of the episodes, I think. The camp episodes? Yeah. She was, she was a little one. Oh, she's on one, but yeah. she's, uh, and that's a situation where going back to talking about operating from values, Pira's dad ran a summer camp when she was a kid. Yeah, yeah. It still runs a camp to this yeah. day. Her dad does. And so, and parks out. It's it's no wonder why the camp program here is so strong because again it's coming from who she is, her values, and having that I think you know background and experience. You know, yeah, yes, that's it's yeah for sure. Um, okay, we've got a couple few more topics here. I think we could skip the one that I asked. We should just do that on an episode, a separate one. Which one did you ask? The final one. So how does space affect culture? Yeah. Um, we got our choice here. Well, as a guest to talk about that. <laughs> um, uh, space culture. Oh, <laughs> we have a David question that's around like increasing um, awareness and sort of my maybe lead gen. It's more around uh, just because you've been in Brooklyn so yeah. long and um, I didn't even know that we would be having any kind of brushing session. I just assumed we would have just. We mm. just like talk over Trace or something like that. But, we'll still uh, probably talk over Trace. Well, I was just really, um, basically just, I've grown in the business in a lot of other ways. And the Prospect Heights, it's, I mean, there's been like two, three new huge residential buildings that have gone up. There's Chelsea Beers, the yeah. Accenture has come up. If people reach out and they're in one of my like two uh, buildings, because now we live in Brooklyn Processing with my studio is at 550. Cause, um, I think like this is probably good because it's possible their income is relatively higher and I still feel like there's like a lot more people in the neighborhood mm -hmm. and I realize that I'm not taking advantage of it at all. I do have a pretty big Google Maps presence. You probably noticed me. And, mm -hmm. um, and then there's leads coming in from different sources, but the actual, like for instance, like with Daniel, like, like the prospect that it's like Facebook group, I haven't really tried that very much. I have enjoyed the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce. What have you done locally? Like, let's say you were your 20 square block radius. You wanted to I raise mean, away. I just have a good Google Maps. Okay, so solid. I haven't really done it, anything else specific to locally. Next it's, door, I haven't tried. Yeah. I haven't tried any. And I'll even say that this is something that when we were doing planning over the last couple of days, this actually came up. The yeah. idea of like, as a strategic, a strategic issue possibly is like, there's, basically no local advertising happening outside of Google Maps and the Google ads, you know? I think just everyone thinking. psychically knew about me, I'm sure that- <laughs> Yeah, that helps. Probably, yeah, there's probably more people, even if it's pretty niched down. So I was just so, curious about your thoughts, Nate, as a book yeah. night or whatever. My, uh, I have many thoughts because we've tested many things. <laughs> um, well, let me just but, make an observation about you. Yeah. I can't walk around the city with you without people stopping you and knowing who you are. Really? Mm. You're a social person. Like when we took a walk last fall, yeah, you got stopped three, four times. You're like, oh, I know that person there. I know that person from here. We were in a party last night, and his yeah. friend is the music director for Seth Meyers. Oh, you know, yeah, we were at the, right. his party last night. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, so it's... So there is something to that, which yeah. is true, which is like we are... we. It actually gets back to the landlord comment. <laughs> it's like we build network in the way that works for us, mm. right? So you you do have a rich network and in, in its friends and acquaintances and and I feel pretty isolated to be honest. Have uh, you? Okay, so, so David, I share that personality trait. Okay, so, dig it. <laughs> well, I, I've gotten better about it in yeah, in, I mean, I in my advancing so age. <laughs> you came out to the big city <laughs> to visit. You right. know the. So, okay, so there is some self-reflection on that piece of being like, yeah. okay, am I, um, how is it going to work for me and my personality? But I'll say some basic things are like, um, you know, Brooklyn is like a small town. It's like, who grew up, did anybody grow up in a small town? Like 10,000 people or like 20,000 or where do you, where do you? I grew up in... Shrubbug, which is near your town, which is near Peekskill. Like, okay, dig it. Yeah, so Brooklyn is much more aligned with 
um, a small little village. It's just a lot of villages, you know? And so we get to know, we get to know a couple baristas. We get, you know, like I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, you know, but we get to know a handful of people and they are, they essentially reflect our, our life patterns. You know, we, how we work, like my friend, I just passed and he wasn't walking his dog. Andy, and he's like, my dog passed away last month. And he's like, and everything's changed now. Like, I don't, well, I've lost a lot of friends because I'm not now walking my dog. And he has all these friends that are just on the dog route, you know? And so I'm getting bummed. Yeah, that's a <laughs> bummer. But it's fascinating when you think about it in terms of how you're going to build awareness of something you do. Uh, question, does your space have any... Uh, is there any retail? I mean, to be honest, my space is, it's our former one bedroom apartment. It's yeah, yeah, dig it. So, right. It, um, yeah, there's no retail uh, presence. There's no, no, nope, not yet. So, uh, and it is a premium program. And I'm the sort of person, like, I definitely can be social and I'm enjoying this. Yes, you're here. And honestly, I'm not the type to, you know, chat with people while walking the dog or chat okay. with the baristas and all that. Uh, Fair so enough. It's interesting that that's, that's where your mind first goes. Well, well, what, uh, well, what were we going to say, Daniel? Oh, I was going to say, this goes back to something we said like 20 minutes ago, that idea of the tactic versus coming from values. Yes. Because actually what happened for me was that, and, you know, piano is a lonely sport. So yeah, yeah, it does. And Can I be. was perfectly fine to go throughout my 20s and be isolated, didn't need anybody, not because I'm necessarily like antisocial. I just... I was so focused on my goals and I didn't see how other people mm. fit into that. And actually, even, even the way that I went about solving my lead problem is very in character for me. Almost everybody here is doing Google ads because Daniel talks about Google ads and I'm not trying to, yeah. that's because I could do it alone. Yes. Totally. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so, and so, and, and even coming from values with like how, <laughs> how I grew, grow your music studio. I eventually got to a point two years in where I was so overall with work to do that it was almost like I was ready to throw my hands up and like admit defeat. And I had never wanted to hire people. And eventually I had to change that because I said, I'm not going to get to where I want to go unless I do. And so my values changed over time. And then even to the point where I, I feel like, and I don't think this is wrong to say, I don't think this is an over-exaggeration to say, say, I actually learned how to, to be social in my 30s, mm. uh, no, no, I'm not done. I, I learned how to be social in my 30s, but not, but not for utilitarian reasons. I would, I would build relationships in my late 20s, early 30s, because I could, I could get something from it. Yeah, totally. And so I'll have people who, like, for instance, we have Brian King in the podcast. And all of a sudden, I start getting all these requests from people like, oh, I got to learn how to do, I got to learn how to do like community events from him. And Brian talked about networking and, and how that really grew his school. He grew from, mm -hmm. he grew from um, 30 kids on June 1st of 2021 to over 300 June 1st of 2023. Mm. And, and as soon as that episode dropped, all the client, not everybody, you didn't. But uh, I'm always complimenting you. <laughs> uh, but um, I, I got a lot of clients who were like, oh, I need, I need to learn what Brian's doing. I'm like, ah, no, 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 you don't get it. Brian, Brian built that. That wasn't a tactic he added on. That's who Brian is. Yeah, totally. You know, th and that's episode 19, I'm pretty sure. Um, so that's a good episode to go back and listen to, provided that you learn the right lesson from it. <laughs> um, and I mean, just what I want to say is that, that to, to, to the point that I, I do actually think Humans are good. It's good to be friendly. It's good to be more social. It's something like that I had to learn, you know, and not just for utilitarian reasons. It, it actually is like, oh yeah, be friendly with the entire world, including someone who might not even be a business contact. You know, um, chat to the chat to the person because you just. You'd be surprised. People are receptive to friendliness. A hundred percent. That's what I learned. I just, and actually one of the things is that I just assumed that people didn't want to be bothered. Yeah. That's how I walked around the world. That's why I wasn't. People don't want to be bothered. That's why, I, you know, and so when I actually learned that lesson, it got a lot better for me, you know. Yeah.